performing meta-analysis in the case of very few studies um, is an important uh, topic. Here's a short overview. I will start, of course, with an introduction and uh, we'll summarize the main models and estimation methods and uh, we'll show you how we perform a qualitative summary of study results uh, within the Institute. Uh, then I try to summarize the problems uh, of meta-analysis with very few studies and we'll show you some examples. Uh, then a uh, discussion follows. And uh, before I close with a summary and uh, conclusion, I will also give an outlook uh, regarding two other promising methods, the better binomial model and uh, Bayesian meta-analysis. Um, yes, but before I do that, um, I like uh, to know roughly from where you are and what's the main affiliation. Okay, yeah, I hope this is uh, interesting for everybody. So university is uh, number one. And uh, yeah, only a few uh, uh, with, with the Cochrane affiliation. Uh, my guess is that this was more but this is interesting. Thank you very much. So, main topic of today is meta-analysis with very few studies. Uh, this is a typical picture. You have only two studies, but dependent on uh, the method you choose, you got very different uh, results. And uh, it's problematic, uh, of course, uh, what is the best method to summarize uh, these two studies? What seems to be so simple at first sight? Uh, most things I will tell you uh, is from these two publications. Uh, one article in Research Synthesis Methods and the other is the book check, uh, chapter in the Meta Research book uh, edited by Evangelo and uh, Veroniki. Uh, in these two publications, uh, yeah, you can read most things I, I discussed today. So uh, most of you will know that uh, we have two main meta-analytic uh, models. Uh, the first one is the model with fixed effect. Here we have the assumptions, all studies estimate the same effect. Therefore, a better term for this model would be common effect model. But in general, it is called a fixed effect model. And so I, I keep it this way. And the second main model is the model with uh, random effects, where we assume that the studies estimate different effects. And uh, within this, uh, this model, um, prediction intervals are useful for illustrating heterogeneity. Of course, there are many more models and approaches, uh, but uh, these are the main uh, models. And uh, with the exception of, of the outlook later, I uh, talk only about uh, these two main models. So, um, Here's a short uh, graphical representation. Uh, I think uh, a lot of you um, knows this paper of Borenstein. Um, yeah, we have two studies, one to do a meta-analysis and the assumption of the fixed effect model is that both studies estimate exactly the same effect. Of course, the estimate in the first study maybe lies here. The estimate in the second study maybe lies here. You have the variance within the studies, but, but no variance between the studies and the pyramid of interest. It, it is a common fixed effect, which is the same in, in both studies. Whereas in, in the random effects model, uh, we, we do not assume that uh, all studies estimate the same effect. We, is, uh, we allow that the two effects in the studies are different from the first study is here, from the second study it is here. 
again, the, the estimate in the first study may be uh, is here, and in the second, it's here. Uh, as before, you have the variance within the studies, but additionally, you have uh, a new parameter, tau square, which is a variance between the studies. And the parameter of interest is now the expected value of the distribution of the uh, two effects. And uh, if you want to make estimations within the random effects model, uh, you have also to estimate the additional variance component uh, tau square. Uh, note regarding prediction intervals. Um, it is important to know the what is the difference between a confidence interval and the prediction interval. Um, yeah, the confidence interval is a range which includes with high certainty the, uh, the true effect of the meta-analysis. So the conclusion whether there is uh, an intervention effect or not should be based on the confidence interval on, and not on the prediction interval. Uh, the prediction interval is a range which includes with high certainty the true effect of a single study. And uh, in this way, the prediction interval is the graphical illustration of the amount of heterogeneity within the random effects model. It is a useful in the, uh, information but not regarding uh, the true effect, but regarding heterogeneity. So the main methods for estimation uh, are the following. Um, yeah, the basic method is that of a uh, method of inverse variance. Um, in this method, you estimate uh, the intervention effect by means of, of a weighted average of um, the effect estimates in the studies. And as weight, you use the inverse of the variance, which means that uh, larger studies get more weight than smaller studies. And uh, yeah, here's a typical conf confidence interval, uh, which uses the normal distribution uh, in the fixed effect model. Um, this basic method has disadvantages in the case of binary data, and uh, especially in the case of a few studies, uh, the mental Hensel method uh, for binary data has advantages. Um, the estimation here is performed by means of uh, uh, the contingent tables. And uh, I've not included the formula here because these are dependent on the effect measure. Um, you can see uh, all formulas in, in the literature. <clears throat> so uh, in, in the random effects model, uh, the standard method for a long time uh, was the Decimon and Laird method, which also use uh, the, the normal distribution. Also, you have the additional variance component uh, uh, tau square. And uh, this is the reason why uh, Desmond Laird has disadvantages, especially in the case of few studies, because uh, Desmond and Laird, uh, this method ignores the uncertainty of the variance estimations. And uh, the consequence is that, especially in the case of few studies, confidence intervals are frequently too narrow and p-values are too small. And this method has been criticized for some time. And uh, the look for alternative uh, methods started um, from the Cochrane collaboration. It is a famous paper by, by RG uh, published in, in Research Synthesis Methods 2019. Um, it's recommended to use the Hartung Knapp Siedig Jonkmann method and uh, to estimate uh, tau by means of the Paula Mandel method. Um, it has been shown by simulation studies that uh, Hartung Knapp, Siedig, Jonkmann holds type one error uh, in general, 
But the disadvantage is that confidence interval are frequently very wide. So this method has uh, not very much power. And uh, yeah, one reason for the wide confidence interval lies here. Now we use uh, the T distribution instead of the normal distribution, um, which has advantage that we, we hold type one error. But uh, yeah, in the case of, of two studies, um, we use instead of the, of the quantile of the normal distribution of 1.96, uh, now uh, the quantile of the t-distribution with one degree of freedom, which is 12.7, uh, which means simply to, uh, due to technical reasons, uh, the, uh, the confidence interval width is six times larger, more than six times larger. Of course, this uh, problem disappears with a, with a number of studies, but uh, in the case of two, three, and also four studies, the confidence intervals are wide be because we use the T distribution. Uh, an additional problem is that uh, the standard errors uh, of, of Hart and Knapp Siedig Jongban can also be too small. Um, the reason for this lies here. Uh, in, in homogeneous data situations, the effect estimates of, of all the studies are very similar. And they are also similar to, to, to the average. And uh, this means this term can get very small. And uh, in these cases, uh, um, the standard errors may be arbitrarily too small and confidence intervals are too narrow. There's a solution to this problem published by Knapp and Harting in 2003 to use this ad hoc variance connection, variance correction. But uh, of course, in practice now, you need a procedure for the decision whether this variance correction has to be used or not. So what we also use in ICWIC is uh, the concept of conclusive effects. Uh, what do we mean by this? Uh, there are data situations in, in which uh, we can conclude that the intervention has an effect also, a meta-analysis with a pooled effect estimation is not uh, possible or at least no, not meaningful. Uh, there are mainly two situations when this is the case. The first is heterogeneity is too large to make a meaningful pooled effect anyway. And the second is that uh, in principle, it is, would be meaningful to, to uh, estimate a pooled effect but the data are insufficient to apply the desired model, mostly the random effects model. So if this is the case, we use the concept of conclusive studies. That means we make a conclusion regarding an effect by means of, of the weights of the studies. Um, a situation where we have a conclusive effect is when we have two or more estimates of the studies in the same direction, then either on the benefit or on the harm side. And uh, if the total weight of these studies is at least 80%, and if we have uh, at least two statistically significant studies, and if the weight of the significant studies is more than 50%, then we say we have a situation with conclusive effects and can conclude that there's an effect. Also, we, it is not possible to make a meta-analysis. We also distinguish between moderately and clearly conclusive effects. Clearly conclusive effects we have if all studies are significant. In the case of three studies, when two are significant and one is not significant, we have moderately conclusive effects. And in the situation with four studies, we use the prediction interval to distinguish between clearly and moderately conclusive effects. If the null effect is 
included in the prediction interval, we say we have moderately conclusive effects. And if the null effect is not included in the prediction interval, we say uh, the conclusive effects are clearly conclusive. So here are uh, some examples, or are there any urgent questions so far? No, we have no questions. That's oh, um, so there is one question. Are any of these new methods from the 2019 RSM publication included in Revman? Are they now applied by default? Um, yes, a, a number of um, methods are included in, in RevMan for, for, for a long time. For example, Mental Hensel. Um, the problem still is, I think, that Hartung Knapp Siedig Jonkman is not included in, in the review manager, but there are plans to do this. But I have no information right now how far this project is. Um, yeah, I believe in the new version of Revman, um, these methods will be available. So I guess after spring, uh, <laughs> we will have some uh, new methods uh, in Revman. Um, okay, so there is one more. Um, if the prediction interval is calculated, it means that the REM estimation is performed anyway, doesn't it? the random effects model. Yes, the prediction interval belongs to the random effects model. But within in the fixed effect model, there is no prediction interval. That's right. If you see a forest plot with prediction interval, then the underlying model is uh, the, random the random effects model, right. Mm 